All right. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, uh, you are at, uh, at uh, this session here for uh, IBM and CloudSoft, how companies of all sizes leverage OpenStack based private clouds. Um, I'm Osmer Mohammed. I'm an offering manager at IBM. Uh, I came into IBM through the Blue Box acquisition, so we've been building private clouds based on OpenStack for more than three years, and we've been delivering it on IBM infrastructure for about almost two, two years. Um, I'll let Duncan introduce himself, but Duncan uh, is a partner and customer um, of uh, Bloomix Private Cloud. Duncan? Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Duncan Johnson, what? Founder and CEO with CloudSoft. Uh, I'll introduce the company more formally in the second half of the presentation, but delighted to be here sharing the stage with you, Asma. All right, perfect. So what we'd like to do is, you know, I think everybody's got their fill of technology and OpenStack and uh, we'll cover a little bit of that today, but what we wanted to convey today was sort of how we're transforming um, these businesses that are running on OpenStack and a managed private cloud and what they're, they're, they're get going through. So we're going to be focused mainly on the, on the companies, um, the ones that are public, we'll share their names, the ones that are not, we'll anonymize them. Um, and I'll do that the first half. And then the second half, actually, I'm going to let uh, Duncan tell his story. Um, so, you know, you hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, and we keep it, you know, I think we've got a reasonable sized crowd, so if there's any questions, um, we'll, 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 uh, I think we'll take it towards the end, but we'll okay. definitely have ample time to, uh, to, to cover that. All right, so just a quick primer on what IBM's offering is around the private cloud. So um, again, these are built off the foundations of uh, Blue Box. And so the first two that you see, Bluemix Private Cloud and Bluemix Private Cloud Local, those are, the, uh, those are offerings that came in through the acquisition. We modified them to run um, completely on soft layer or you know, soft layer is now known as Bluemix infrastructure. Uh, we use community OpenStack um, and you know, IBM even prior to the acquisition, acquisition of Bluebox was a huge contributor to, uh, to OpenStack and we actually built, you know, built the service on top of sort of the, uh, the, 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 the contribution of the community. Uh, and, um, and what we do, as you saw in the keynote yesterday, you know, private, you know, manage private clouds is where you have um, sort of a, a joint responsibility between the customer and the vendor to sort of deliver the cloud experience. I'll cover a little bit, a little bit more on that. Um, so for any, any customer that doesn't want any vendor lock-in, wants community OpenStack, wants to deploy sort of you know, generic um, operating systems, uh, they may want to run a PaaS that's open source. Uh, we feel that Bluemix Private Cloud and Bluemix Private Cloud Local uh, would be, would be uh, optimal for that. And the difference between Bluemix Private Cloud and Bluemix Private Cloud Local, Private Cloud runs in a soft layer data center. There's about 24 soft layer data centers in the world. We can stand up a, a private cloud in less than three days in any of those locations. While Bluemix Private Cloud Local runs in your data center. So there are companies that must run behind their firewall um, or have infrastructure that need to leverage behind their firewall and will gladly manage that cloud for you uh, remotely. So we'll have remote hands, we'll, we'll VPN into the environment, but your experience between Bluemix Private Cloud and, and local will be identical. The only difference will be where the physical infrastructure sits. So moving on to the, to the bottom of that, we actually introduced a new offering because we heard from customers, a lot of enterprises, um, that require a, you know, a, a vendor specific distribution or open stack. So we partnered up with Red Hat and really we see this as the best of both worlds. We're, we're gonna bring our scale and our expertise in running private clouds uh, to the table while customers that have a support contract or have applications that require RHEL and, and that Red Hat stack to run can, can get the benefit from, from IBM and also the benefit from Red Hat. So if you've got a, you've got, you need RHEL OS or you need running you know, Windows or SUSE, you wanna run an enterprise database, you wanna run OpenShift or Docker orchestration, uh, that will be the offering that we would position um, for our customers, all right? But again, the people that are supporting these, the automation that we use, the data centers that we deploy on are identical between Bluemix Private Cloud and Bluemix Private Cloud with Red Hat. So in terms of OpenStack services, we support nine today. Uh, we've got a couple that we're adding here in the next couple of months. And um, you know, if you're familiar, you know, most of you are familiar with, um, with your, uh, with your um, with your cell phones, the way that uh, these services will show up is they'll just show up um, the next time you log in. So we will actually do the deployment of the services in the back end, and then we'll just turn it on for you, uh, you know, during, during that next, next maintenance window. So it is as simple as that experience that you get 
on your, um, you know, on your cell phone and also as, as you would get uh, if you're going in the public cloud. So we do try to make the experience running a, running a private cloud and consuming the private cloud very similar to what you would see in the public domain. The only difference would be that the bare metal infrastructure that you're running on is dedicated just for one customer. And the model that we've seen after you know, run, doing this for, for many years is what we call you know, a shared responsibility model. So let's start with what IBM does. You know, we focus on the things that run underneath the hypervisor. So you know, this is a sample of things that we would do. So anything to do with keeping the management and the uptime of the, of the cloud, we take that on. You know, the oily bits that you don't want to touch is how I would tell it tell to customers. So if there's a security breach, we will patch it. If there's a failure in the services or the, or the bare metal infrastructure, we will go replace it, right? Uh, we'll maintain the, the SLA, 99.95. If we don't maintain the SLA, we give money back to you, right? So we, we, manage, we manage the cloud um, uh, because we know that it's important to, to you as a, as a business, and we will actually you know, provide you credits uh, for, for not keeping uh, our end of the bargain. Uh, we'll do upgrades and maintenance. So these are the things that if any of you who've Run, uh, built the OpenStack cloud, it's easy to sort of get to the first milestone. The question is whether you can get to the second and third and fourth milestone, right? And so we run hundreds of clouds. Uh, we try to keep them standard, standardized, and we learn from every single interaction that we have with our clouds, uh, and it pays dividends across all of, the, uh, all of our customer base. Uh, technical support. So anytime that you have an issue within OpenStack, uh, a, an API question, or something's not working as, as expected, you call us. And we have experts that are ready, 7 by 24, to go do that. Uh, we also will, uh, uh, we will also assign you a customer success manager that will help you onboard. We actually have a five week protocol in terms of getting you onboard with OpenStack. So a lot of these things that people have a hard time or they have to go through different vendors, we try to bring that into one consistent experience for all of our customers. So what do you do as a customer? Well, anything to do with the virtual instances and the applications, right? We don't want to touch your data. Right? We don't want to tell you what automation scripts to use. We don't want to tell you what OSs to use. You go ahead and, and, and use whatever you want. Right? Very similar to what you, the experience that you have in the, in the public cloud. Um, backup and application. Uh, backup and, uh, uh, for VM and, and, and your applications. Right? You may have a tool that you need to use. We're not going to specify what, what, what that is. Uh, additional users that you want beyond the cloud, uh, cloud administrator. So all these things uh, we do, and then and we, we find that in, in our two, three years of running clouds that we found a happy medium where customers actually do want control of their cloud, but they're also parts of the cloud they have, they want, have no interest in. All right, so that's a quick overview of sort of the offering. Let's, uh, let's see what we've done with our customers. So first off is Treehouse. Um, Treehouse is an education company. They're based in the Pacific Northwest, and they provide online education for professionals that want to learn how to code, right? Um, which is a, you know, a huge growing market, similar to what you see with you know, Code Academy and, and, and things of, of that nature. Um, Treehouse was a customer of Blue Box prior to us being acquired by IBM. And so one of the big things we had to go do, we had to move them from our data centers into an IBM data center. So we physically had to move their cloud. And in the process, we also had to upgrade their cloud. So there were a bunch of moving parts. Um, we actually ran two clouds side by side for them, so allow ample time for them to migrate. But what they were looking for, right, when, they, when, when, uh, when we became part of IBM, they were very concerned about, hey, are you guys gonna become very curated and very specific about, about your implementation or OpenStack? So that's why they wanted to keep their old cloud running. They really literally wanted to see API call to API call, whether we were staying consistent. And we did, right? So they were able to validate over a period of 30 days that it was, you know, it truly was open infrastructure. We had backward compatibility around the API. Uh, we provide competitive pricing to them. Uh, they were, they were, we had, we used different um, storage between our old data center and the new one. So the old data centers, we had a vendor specific SAN that we used, while in, in, uh, in, uh, in IBM, we used Ceph. And so they wanted to make sure that whatever applications they ran before got the same IOPS. Actually, we gave them more IOPS running on Ceph. And then we, they needed the same SLA as before, right? These are a bunch of guys that do coding. They have no ops people on staff. They are completely dependent on us. So, um, so we were able to go uh, deliver that. You know, the, the solution was IBM Bluemix Private Cloud. The picture gives you sort of what that, what that uh, infrastructure looks like. Um, we built them infrastructure with separate control and data planes. So we had dedicated controllers running all the OpenStack services. 
and then they had a choice of different uh, compute nodes because they had different kinds of workloads that they were deploying. So we built different um, uh, resource pools to, to ensure that workloads will go on the right type of compute node. And then they had a uh, block storage, we call it hybrid, hybrid block storage node uh, running, on, uh, running with Ceph in the background. And then we have a pair of gateways. So all of our clouds have a pair of gateways on the front. That's where we put the ACLs, the firewalls, any termination of VPNs and whatnot. So that's what we did. So Treehouse, I believe, has one location in DC and there's potential for them to move to another one. So we're, we're, as you'll see with, uh, with Duncan's presentation, uh, a lot of our customers tend to deploy more than one cloud. Um, the next one is Lixil. So Lixil is a company in Japan. Uh, the, if you're from the US, they are equivalent of the Home Depot of Japan. And Lixil came about via a, uh, a, 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 a um, uh, acquisition of five companies. And so uh, when they started engaging with IBM prior to actually prior to the Blue Box acquisition, um, they were already on a strategic path to go figure out how they were going to go from five different IT platforms to one. And so what they landed on, where they were, they were going to have two major platforms. They had a platform that was based on OpenStack, and any net new applications were going to be built on OpenStack. And they also had their enterprise workloads that were not being refactored, and those were going to stay on VMware. But what was, what was clear is they were going to get out of the data center business. So both their VMware platform and their OpenStack platform is being hosted in, the, in an IBM data center, literally side by side. So, um, so, but focusing on the OpenStack piece, so they made a strategic decision to go with OpenStack. Um, they, couldn't, um, they, they couldn't move to the public cloud, but they wanted an elastic and public cloud type of experience. And so we went through, we actually did a three month POC with them in the Tokyo data center to prove all these things. So very similar to what we did with, um, with uh, Treehouse, they just need to see the IOPS, make sure that the applications could do their, their API compatibility was, was uh, so on and so forth. And, um, and they were expanding too. So they actually had a, a, a five year growth plan and they wanted to make sure that as they went through month by month, we could actually deploy additional resources within the SLA that we provided, which is less than one day, right? So they could have additional compute nodes, additional storage nodes deployed and available to them in OpenStack in a day or less. So we went through a lot of that and it was, um, it was, a, it was, a, it was a great win. So in terms of what that looked like, um, again, very similar to what we did for, um, for Treehouse, just at a larger scale. So we had the same dedicated controllers, the same Viata pair, uh, but instead of a, a one gigabit ethernet link into the data center, we had a 10 gig eth gigabit ethernet link in and it was a dedicated circuit. So they actually had a dedicated circuit from their location to the IBM data center, and then it would pass through the Viatas before it got to the OpenStack infrastructure. And then they had uh, a choice of different compute nodes. Um, I optimized, just to give you an example, our, our, is our compute node with SSD back storage and the fastest CPU that we have in our catalog. And then, so, but the additional thing that they, they needed, they needed access to bare metal servers. So they had workloads that could run on virtual machines. That was the primary use case that they had for their OpenStack cloud, but they also had some items that needed to run in, in bare metal, specifically databases. So uh, we don't have Ironic yet. You probably noticed that in the, in the second slide that I showed, but IBM, uh, by virtue of, of, of us having the software infrastructure, we can provision bare metal servers and connect it over the network. So even though you can't provision the bare metal servers through OpenStack, you can consume bare metal servers by, you know, by, by provisioning it via a, a separate set of APIs and then linking it over the network. Um, one interesting thing that we have to do with, um, with Lixil was the last item that you see on the, on the list, which is VM live migration. So uh, they were long-term VMware users. They were very used to being able to move VMs on, you know, on, as, as they need it. Um, as you know, with modern Elastic Clouds, you sort of just let the scheduler decide where it goes within the resource pool, and then, and then your application deals with any, any sort of uh, uh, re restart of the VM if, if you need to. Well, they, they, couldn't make that, you know, they couldn't make that operational change. So we actually went ahead and enabled VM line migration for them. And so um, they don't use it very often. I think a lot of times is when, as they migrate their workloads off of their old infrastructure to the new ones, they may have put the workload on the wrong compute node 
And so to free up some space, they may use this, but it's not something they use every day. But it was something that we had to innovate and deliver and make sure it was available to them uh, in, that, in, that, um, in that time frame. All right, so the last one, I had to anonymize, but it's a real estate company um, in Asia. And, uh, and so they're doing, you know, unlike a lot of places in the US where you're sort of building in a small plot of land, um, and, and, and it's really a one or two residences, the, these, uh, this company here creates city master plans. So they, they take a sw huge swath of land, they develop it, and all sorts of things come along with it, schools, uh, residential, commercial. And so, but what they wanted to do, they wanted to control the experience, very similar to how we control the experience for our customers, they wanted to control their, uh, the experience for their customers. So think of TV, think of audio, security, all of that was gonna be wired together. So they needed a very modern infrastructure to sort of build that, that out. Um, but they couldn't host it in an IBM data center, right? Part of their master plan was to have the IT inside a part of their master plan. So, but they're a real estate, a real estate company. They don't know how to run IT. Um, so what we ended up doing is we ended up deploying Bluebox, sorry, uh, Bluemix Private Cloud local for this customer. Uh, okay, I lied. I lied. We are building it right now. So literally we have, we have people uh, in Asia, building out um, the cloud right now, and um, and uh, and, it, and it's going well. We hope to ha have it lit up and hand the API endpoints to them before the end of the week. Um, and so, what they were looking for was absolutely location. So it needed to be local, but also they knew that at some point their customers would have would want to go and go to the public cloud. And so, you know, different from 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 uh, from private cloud, we have a, a public cloud and something that they wanted to have uh, be able to tie. So for example, they could provide credentials to a customer that would work on their private cloud and also on their, on their public cloud. So those were things that they wanted to make sure were available to them. And then for the commercial side of their city plan, they also wanted to make sure that those customers could get more than just IaaS, right? And so that's where you know, some of the other parts of IBM, visioning, garage, consulting, managed services, were the things they wanted to partner up with. So it was, you know, it was while we're gonna talk about OpenStack, a lot of what uh, swayed the customer over to, um, to IBM was definitely around location and also around the value add services around there. So, and what it looked like, hey, it looks actually very similar to what we, we talked about before. And the reason why is that we, we build standard clouds, right? So for as much as we see a lot of customers have very unique problems, very unique needs, right? And they start off looking very, very different. When you actually start building your cloud, it actually ends up looking fairly similar, right? A little bit of customization, there's definitely a lot of people skills that are different, but the underlying technology is the same. And, and for, you know, speaking as an operator, that's how we can run all these clouds and upgrade them, right, very easily, right? They all fundamentally look the same to us. So, but again, it's, uh, it's built, again, even though it's an on-prem solution, we still have the dedicated controllers, we have the same type of compute nodes, and instead of the hybrid storage, which is a mix of uh, SSDs and, and, and uh, hard drives, uh, this one here is pure SSD, so they want a performance you know, right out of the gate. So, um, so, you know, so in, in, you know, in, in summary, what, what, what I would say around a lot of these customers, right, obviously they were looking to go to a modern platform. Uh, it was never, like in the case of Lixil, it was, it was deliberate to have two platforms, right? They, they understood that you can't, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. You can't take a legacy app and try to run it on OpenStack. And I think, you know, maybe some of you know this already, it's really hard. You can't, you can't try to make OpenStack run like VMware. There'll always be things in the VMware stack that cannot be replicated um, on OpenStack. Having said that, in the case of live migration, we were able to replicate that and definitely meet the needs of the customer. Um, uh, we, we definitely dealt with customers that really their core competency wasn't running the infrastructure, right? So if you've got a, you know, if you're, if you're, a, if you're a corporation, if you're an organization that has people in data centers, Right, you, you deal with wiring and cabling and stacking, racking and stacking. Um, managed private clouds isn't really a good fit because you know, what we do is we take away the things that you're not interested in. If you're transforming yourself from a company that's used to do that but you wanna move further up the stack, then managed private cloud makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and then I think you know, hybrid is definitely something that we've seen a lot. So we have customers that actually started, like I think, um, uh, this, the real estate company actually did their POC on the hosted platform because it was the easier, cheaper thing to do. 
but then when we actually deployed it or deploying it, we did it locally because the experience was the same. They got to they got 95% of what they needed from the from the hosted offering, but they finally went to to the local. Um, and we're actually seeing customers uh, run both local and uh, dedicated. Uh, they would run production on on uh, the local, and they would run uh, test dev on on hosted. So we're seeing all, all sorts of different combinations here. Uh, as we as we uh, as we go deeper and deeper into into uh, into the market, so with that, Duncan, I'm going to pass it over to you and let uh, let you tell the story, tell your story. Thank you. So now we're switching to I guess our experience, um, and uh, I would say I really like that slide, the division of responsibilities, because you know that's been borne out by our experience. But I'll get into that in a second. So so. We're not as well known as IBM and Red Hat, so here's a quick summary of who we are and what we're doing. And so our focus is on hybrid cloud application management. And I'll explain in a couple of slides what I mean by that, but key to us is being able to model an application and then to be able to deploy it and most importantly manage it throughout its life cycle. Um, I was talking actually, I met with the uh, uh, GM for OpenStack for Red Hat this morning, uh, Rakesh, and he said, well, that's, that's really letting a thousand flowers bloom on this platform. And I really like that idea that, you know, it, the platform is rock solid, but it's what you then do with it that I think interests us and our, our customers. Um, we're very much involved in the open source movement. Uh, we are in fact, the founders of Apache Brooklyn, which if you're familiar with the Apache software process, uh, sorry, the foundation process, um, you go through kind of school, you know, you incubation, uh, primary, secondary, and eventually you sort of graduate. Um, so we're now a top level project, which is very important for us and for the community. And that's really the foundation of everything I'm going to talk about. When I talk about the CloudSoft application management platform, I'm talking about the commercial offering built upon Apache Brooklyn. And we're pioneers in what's known as autonomic computing. So this is the idea that essentially you want to do everything fully automated, end-to-end, -end, uh, and in much, the way, in much the same way that your, your autonom autonomous nervous system keeps your heartbeat, core temperature, uh, breathing uh, regulated, especially when you're standing on stage and you know, don't really want to be thinking about those things. Um, it's the same idea within, within IT. So, model, deploy, and manage. So the model is, think of that as really the blueprint in fact, we call it a blueprint. So that defines the components that make up your application, the interconnection or relationship between those, any dependencies that need to be sort of uh, taken care of. But most importantly of all, then the policies that you want to apply at runtime, really the best management practices around how to actually look after this application or service. So that model you can think of as being the class if you're into sort of object-oriented programming. So now you want to take that model, that blueprint, and deploy it somewhere. And so. That, at that point, you instantiate a live model of that same blueprint. So now you've got real software components, you've brought them up correctly, you've wired up everything, you've made sure all the dependencies are, are sort of dealt with, recognized, and now it's running on your cloud. Um, what you then want to be able to do is, is actually get data from it, sense what's going on in the environment, both from the application itself, but also from the surrounding environment. So that may be through the, the platform, it may be through other network monitoring tools. But the idea is that this is a living, breathing thing, and you want to get data from it in order to manage it properly. So unless something is providing you with that data, you can't react to situations that arise and then take action. And so that's the whole notion of management. So sensing the environment and then affecting the environment are fundamental concepts. And you do that on an ongoing basis. So the blueprint is not fixed for all time. It's a bit like you, you build your house, but now you want to add a, an extra wing to it maybe two wings, you know, maybe you've got divorce, so you need, you need separate houses. But the idea is, um, that's a terrible joke, my wife will kill me when I get home, <laughs> and it's being recorded, so uh, um, never ad lib, that's my advice. Um, but the idea is those, those blueprints really do allow you to actually land and expand on any environment. So that does run the gamut from physical, that can be bare metal, uh, it can be just a plain vanilla, bring your own nodes or bring your own servers to the party through to virtual, then local or dedicated private environments. So local being on-prem typically, dedicated or managed uh, being something that's being hosted for you. Now you heard probably yesterday's keynote that you know, 
we're now looking at private cloud in three different ways, including remote managed. So uh, the point is that whatever the flavor of cloud, public, private, uh, virtual or physical, our blueprints will run in those environments. And in some cases, they'll run across many of those environments. So this is a mind map of the CloudSoft AMP product. I don't expect you to take it all in, but the idea is that you're, you're basically able to connect through to private clouds, to enterprise infrastructure, to public clouds. You can also connect through to and work with things like Cloud Foundry um, and Kubernetes and blockchain. The idea, these are all aspects or examples of what you can do once you have an autonomic control plane and you have an application management platform. So the fundamental thing is the platform on its own is not very interesting, but when you build up sets of blueprints, it becomes much more interesting. So why did we choose IBM and Red Hat? Well, if I wind the clock back, prior to the, the partnership between Red Hat and IBM, we'd already engaged with the Blue Box team just after uh, we met with them actually in Paris before the acquisition. In the course of getting to know them, they got acquired by IBM. Um, and I think we were the first actual uh, IBM software-based um, private cloud to be stood up, and that was in San Jose. So that's going back 18 months now. <clears throat> but we didn't just stick with one, one location. We always wanted to have multiple locations because one of the things we feel is really important is to be able to actually uh, deploy real-world applications across real-world infrastructure. So we wanted to roll out a global private cloud. And that becomes a testbed for us, and it also becomes a great proving ground for customer evaluations. Um, so fast forward to literally, uh, what, end of, end of March? So at the end of March, um, the, we actually upgraded our environment, and at this point we decided not just to upgrade two of the nodes. In fact, one of them we moved from Singapore to Tokyo, not physically, but we chose to relocate and reposition ourselves across San Jose, London, and Tokyo. But in London, we felt we should actually work with Red Hat and actually stand up a Red Hat-powered uh, uh, Bluemix private cloud. <clears throat> so we did. So as you described, when you sort of brought on a customer from their environment into, into the Bluemix environment, we did much the same thing, moving from the old environment to the new environment. So we were running in uh, London, San Jose, and Singapore. And so that great process went really, really smoothly. So this is a depoliticized view of the world. Um, uh, when we post these slides, I'll give the credit. It came from, it's a Creative Commons from uh, Wikipedia. So this is the situation today, three clusters, one in London, one in San Jose, and one in Tokyo. But that, frankly, would not be terribly interesting to us, were it not for the fact that we can now connect those. So there's a fully meshed private network, and this is where we're actually able to leverage IBM's own private network, which is something that software brought to the party. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but... Um, I think the, 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 the couple of things here, so they, they look like one from a, a keystone standpoint. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, there's, we enable single sign-on <clears throat> for, uh, for CloudSoft. So the same credentials um, that work in San Jose will also work in Tokyo and London, right? So that's, that's key, so that's a single consistent experience. I think um, the second thing is obviously the lines that connect together. So that's the global network, the global private network that all soft layer data centers are connected by. So um, you, can, you can send traffic, replication traffic, whatever it is that you want from one cloud to the next for free. Yep. The, not just free, but it's reliable as well. So, I mean, this was one of the things that if you're gonna choose a partner, choose one that does have a global footprint, but also can provide you with, from a security point of view, a very robust, reliable uh, way of connecting those, uh, those individual clusters. So that what you can then do, of course, is choose when or if you want to go out onto the internet, of course you do, you're offering a client-facing application, but it also gives you the ability to do things like uh, uh, wide area of replication. So we've worked a lot with Basho and React as a, as a good example of that. Um, but of course, in order to do that, I have to complete this incredibly expensive, only done on Sunday um, uh, graphic, which shows, of course, us running the application management platform in each of those locations. And again, just as you do at the network, and the OpenStack here, we're able to sort of utilize all of those locations from any one of those points of view. So we can, we can be starting up in 
in London and deploy to both London, San Jose, and Tokyo, and vice versa. So it gives you complete flex flexibility. And of course, uh, we're not limited to those three uh, locations. There are you know, 50, 60 data centers around the world where we could drop one of these clusters in. And actually, as I look at that, I think it's somewhat northern hemisphere biased. At least with Singapore, we just about crept into the southern hemisphere. So we'll probably at some point look at... Um, Australia. Uh, well, possibly. I, I'd like to go there. The only problem with that is if you look at the submarine cables, I'm not sure it's always the most efficient place to land and expand. <laughs> so this is one of these interesting things. When you actually get into the guts of the internet and the global networking, it really is submarine cables that will drive where, where you want to put things, which is why Singapore, by the way, is a, is a, is a great point yeah. to, of presence. Well, one thing I also want to touch upon, right? So what we actually did when we migrated CloudSoft from the old infrastructure to the new, plus migrate them from data center to data center, we actually built parallel clouds. So we actually built these new clouds yep. um, in the same data center as, as uh, 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 what they were in. And then we provided a, a time where they could migrate their workloads, right? So going back to a couple of sites back where we had that shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. So we would build the clouds, we provide the API endpoints, credentials and whatnot, but we're dependent on the customer to sort of move, move the workloads. Part of it is customers know their workloads better than we do. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is we don't touch customer data, right? There's a, there's a lot of compliance and security con you know, concern. And so that, again, it really is sort of around what we want to go do with, you know, with the private cloud. We do want to help you get your applications running, get you, get you going, migrate, ride the technology curve. I think you know, on, the, on the new infrastructure, it's faster. Oh, and, it's and, 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 and I think the, the Double the capacity. Yeah. And yeah, the, the one mistake we made, and this was our choice, not your, was we went for the sort of uh, entry level clusters. So one gig, top of rack, and basically everything's now 10 gig um, and you know, a lot more horsepower. And in the case of the, uh, you probably want to get into the guts of the Red Hat configuration, yeah. it's, it's even richer than that, isn't it, with the separate controllers? Exactly, and so right. And so, you know, but, but the thing we're going to go to is like really allow customers write, write the innovation curve, write the cost curve. You know, but also not make them reinvent themselves every every yep. every twelve months. So we're we're there to really help you migrate uh, because again, run letting CloudSoft run their business, you know, provide value to their customers is the most important thing, and we're there to sort of stay out of the way. So the way the way we see it is, if you don't if you don't notice IBM and the Blue Box team, we're doing our job. Yeah. So. And and by the way, you're not. If somebody's worried about well, how much control do I have over this? You still have exactly the same access to. Uh, to the OpenStack environment. You can set things up yourself, and in our case, oftentimes that's automatically. Uh, but the idea is that if there's ever an issue, there's always somebody that you can call night or day, 24-7. Um, and I, I used to almost be terrified of calling the help, because if I did, I'd get three people <laughs> all pinging me, saying, how can I help? I mean, it was phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Um, so, so, but that's quite good, actually. That, that does train you to think, if I do that, I'm going to create, you know, a lot of excitement, so, uh, but you know, phenomenal support, phenomenal response. Um, uh, and in terms of the migration, yes, I mean, helping us migrate both the, not just the applications, which actually, as you rightly point out, we have a good handle on, but also making sure that the environment was replicated, which is, is also important in this kind of, in this context. And everything we're doing here, of course, we're doing this, we're learning as we go, and that then benefits our customers. So when we work with customers that are Red Hat uh, customers, they're delighted that we have a Red Hat environment because they can look at what we're doing with OpenShift as well as, of course, what we're doing with Cloud Foundry and Bluemix and so on and so forth. Yeah, and, and again, and, and I think this also shows we're fairly agnostic when it comes to the solution, right? We're, what we provide is the experience and the, and the uptime. Whether you decide to run all community, all Red Hat, a combination of both, mm -hmm. that's really the customer choice. Exactly, thank you. Um, so in summary, you know, better together is a lame political slogan, which we could probably do with in the UK right now. But yeah, you know, we do get and, and a here. very, a very, very consistent experience wherever we go with these guys. And it's not just the Bluemix private cloud. We're also working with them within the context of the Bluemix container service. That's probably a talk for another day. But again, it's it's they're very open. You get the APIs you expect, not some uh, sort of homegrown thing. Um, and you can do cool stuff, like uh, you can run blockchain networks, and uh, as I've mentioned before, multi-site database replication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and so, slide where, that's the blockchain stuff, and these are a couple of the announcements. But it's probably, do we have time just to quickly, I won't try and 
do everything. Yeah, yeah, we should do, you know, see, so you're going to do this live? I'm, I'm going to try and do a demo. All right, there we go. All right, so. Now, I do know that I have to turn PowerPoint off, otherwise um, I can see it, but all you see is that, which I'm sure Red Hat and IBM are delighted, but it, it's not actually showing a demo if I stay in PowerPoint mode, so. Um, so now I killed everything. All right. No, there nope, we go. It's there. Okay, excellent. There was no pause there, nothing, no panic, uh, no, no look on my face that said, heck. Um, so, um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to try and deploy sort of a, a, a uh, globally spanning sort of hyperledger fabric or indeed a, a Kubernetes cluster. But these are just examples of some of the things that one can do. So if I actually uh, drill down on one of these. So uh, this is showing um, us running essentially a fabric that is spanning. This is spanning San Jose, Tokyo, and London. Uh, I'm now looking obviously at the world through my eyes, which is looking at the software that's running on, on, on those clusters. But the point is that's a single blueprint spanning multiple locations. Um, and we can also do that across multiple clouds. So if I just close that guy up. And this is the other thing. Same blueprint, just gave it different locations. Instead of saying, deploy us in uh, Bluemix uh, private cloud across the three locations that we, we manage, uh, uh, we said, no, let's, let's run it across Amazon, Google, and Azure. Sorry, IBM. Yeah, um, and and are, you, are you making native OpenStack calls when you're deploying to? What, no, what we're doing, so I should have mentioned this earlier, under the covers, we also use Apache J Clouds. So that gives us the lingua franca for, for things like um, compute and storage. The networking is, is still a little challenging, but we've put some thought into providing application network security that maps very much onto things like security groups and so on. So it works beautifully in AWS and, and on OpenStack. Okay. So the same, again, it's bubbling up these concepts. So from an applications, point, applications developer point of view, I'm creating a blueprint that really is Venn diagrams. So all I care about is these things are in one group, these things are in another group, this can talk to this over this port and vice versa. You know, so rather than getting into, into really you know, deep territory when you're doing SDN or overlay or anything like that. So okay. um, and then finally, there is a Kubernetes cluster which we deployed earlier. This is the cooking show, after all, um, where what we're essentially doing, again, it's another blueprint, and that blueprint stands up a Kubernetes cluster for you. Uh, and one can obviously do this automatically, but in terms of the idea of an eff effectors and, and so on, um, you, here's the worker cluster. I can resize by delta, so I better make sure I know what the size is. OK, so six, well, yes, I did ask for six worker nodes. So each one of those, by the way, maps onto a, a, an OpenStack VM running on Bluemix. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, I can say, OK, Delta, um, I'm just going to go up by one. Is that going to do that, Robert, or is that going to take it down to one? It's going to go up by one. You see, never work with children, animals, or CEOs. Uh, so there we go. It's just started another node like that. Yeah. So, and if and you're you, really interested in what's going on, you can poke into it and see that it's starting, it's provisioning it, uh, and so on and so forth. All of which is useful when you're debugging, not what you want to do when you're doing stuff fully automated. Right. But just, just one example of the kind of thing one can do. Yeah, I, I really like the, this, this, uh, this demo because it doesn't really need to show OpenStack. OpenStack's in the background, we're doing our stuff, and it'll be clear if we're not doing what, we're, what the SLA says, this demo won't work. So, you know, we're, we're sort of, the invisible hand in the back. All right, um, I think we've got a couple more minutes. If there's any questions, if you can head to the uh, mic. Um, more than happy to, to, to answer those. So you mentioned having a single sign-on between OpenStack instances and the three locations. Are you using uh, federated Keystone for that? So yes. You log in to yeah, so we're, we're, using, we're using Keystone to Keystone Federation. Because, um, mm -hmm. uh, but we also for some customers actually they'll have a they'll have a um, they'll have an ID provider on the back end, like you know like a like a central database. Yep. So in the case of in the case of uh, CloudSoft, they're using Keystone to Keystone Federation, so the three clouds trust each other. 
uh, but we do have another model where uh, you can use an ID provider. Cool, thank you. Yep. Again, it's the idea it's pluggable, so, yeah. which I think is a the theme of this conference, isn't it? The idea of uh, com unpacking com things. Yeah, compostable, I think. Is what composable. Composable, compostable. Yeah, yeah compostable. <laughs> uh, Ouch. Yeah. Um, anything, uh, any, anything else? One more, oh, go. So what are, the, what are the services span across data centers apart from Keystone? What about Horizon? What about Glance? Do you have a way of making sure that the images sync up across geos? And from a portal perspective, is Horizon a single dashboard for multiple regions? Right, good, good, all good questions. So today, what we federate across um, is, uh, is Keystone. I think it's the only thing that we federate across. Um, so yeah, so in the case of Horizon, in order for Duncan's team to go from San Jose to Tokyo, they'll have to go put in the, you know, the appropriate DNS name or the IP address. But uh, what I would say is, and this is, this is actually suited our purposes, is each one of these we can treat as an individual endpoint, because logically that's what we want to do. If, if I want to you know, deploy an application, I want to control where particular components are running. But the really cool thing, which it's kind of magic to someone like myself is that there's a shared private network that shows up in all of those clusters. And as long as you're using that network, everything is fully connected. And really what we wanted was connectivity versus trying to sort of synchronize images and so on, because we're not really of, of so much concerned about images as we are building software. So typically we'll take stock images and we'll work with those. And then we lay down you know, the software and not just install software, but make sure it boots up correctly and that all the interconnections are, and dependencies are taken care of. So, so that really suited our model. It's, it's in a way, it's the least invasive way of doing it because you can ignore it. And if you want to use it, it's just a shared private network. Yeah, and I remember the conversation we had around single sign-on, um, it was really about if there's a new person that joins CloudSoft, in, instead of having to put the credentials in three times, mm -hmm. You just put it in once, right? Whilst for other customers, they truly want to know who you are, right? So I think that's, for, at least for us, we've seen the use case be diff different between Keystone and Keystone Federation versus an ID provider. No. But yeah, so, so, but, you know, but to say that, we know this, this uh, uh, there were, we, we've been working together for 18 months. We've had items on the roadmap. There were things where we, you know, uh, CloudSoft committed to us and we put things on the roadmap. And so as OpenStack, improves support across all these different projects and you know and what's important to uh, to ibm is that they're stable because ultimately we we drive a service so whatever we put into production needs to work and so you know quality of the code stability and whatnot is key but as as that innovation curves continues in openstack uh, we'll gladly adopt it and you know make it available to customers but good question all right, so we are at 4.20. Um, I, I, on behalf of uh, Duncan and IBM, I'd like to thank you for being with us. We're, we'll hang out, but thanks for... Uh, thank coming. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>